All right, we're in the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the Roman churches. And this is chapter two. Uh, here's the quiz from last week. The quiz was from uh, Romans chapter one, part two. Uh, true or false? Let me get my pen ready here. Uh, true or false? It's always best to begin evangelism with a person by giving all the different proofs you can think of that there is a God. And once they're convinced of that, then you can tell them to ask Jesus into their heart. Uh, this is false. Uh, as it says in uh, chapter one of Romans, men are without excuse to know that there is a God. And anyone who would um, tell you to prove that there's a God to begin with when you're trying to evangelize them uh, is simply deflecting uh, the main question. They don't want to acknowledge that there's a God. And until they're willing to do that, uh, the gospel's not gonna uh, be of any benefit to them. So you can always just make yourself available to them when they're ready to listen. Maybe the Holy Spirit has not uh, yet convicted them of their need for Christ. Uh, or maybe their heart is so hard, hard that uh, God has already given them over. So we just don't know the answer to that question. True or false, the pagan mind knows God exists because God has made himself known to them, both within them and through creation. Yet he worships God's creation rather than the creator. He simply bypasses God. He exchanged God, he exchanges God for God's creation. But now the creation is placing demands on him, sort of like the Paris Climate Accords, and that's true. Um, they just walk right by God, and it's like God never existed. So they go into all kinds of things like evolution and you know millions of years and billions of years and a th a random chance and all of that kind of stuff, and they, uh, you know, Mother Earth, Gaia, all of that kind of craziness. Uh, and uh, so they would rather see human beings die than some part of nature, some animal go extinct. True or false, homosexuality is a judicial ruling of God on those who refuse to acknowledge him as their creator. Uh, God gives them over. He hands them over to another. The result of this is that they degrade themselves from their divine design in the area of sexuality and are paid back in their own persons for this deviation. And that is true. That's exactly what Paul uh, says happens uh, to those who uh, continually just reject uh, God. It's a judicial ruling of them uh, being given over. True or false, an additional judicial ruling for those who exchange the truth of God for a lie is that God gives them over to a mind that can no longer make distinctions between what is right and what is wrong in terms of godly conduct in other areas of life. A list of 21 sins characterizes their behaviors, and that's true. True or false, a society that knows these things are wrong and yet approves of them is a society that is due for the judgment of God. America has been such a society for at least the last 50 years. The recent election indicates that the majority of the people want a government that will continue to make laws that violate God's basic standards for marriage, life, family, borders, justice, liberty, and many more things. And that's true. So this is a nation that is uh, due for judgment. How long God will remain patient with this uh, uh, country, I don't know. But uh, we should be praying and we should be doing our job as the church, which is to uh, make disciples. Here's our outline. We're still in the section called condemnation, which will continue through chapter three. So from Chapters 1, 18 through 320, Paul's painting this picture of the condemnation of all men before God. And he divides mankind into three groups, pagan Gentiles, which we covered last week. Today it's moral Gentiles and partly the, uh, the Jews under the Mosaic law, but we'll get into more on uh, the Mosaic Jews. 
uh, next, next time. And then he summarizes all men in chapter 3, verse 9 through 20. So today's lesson, we're kind of working through moral Gentiles, if you will. So here's uh, Romans 1 and 2. Uh, I'm picking up from verse 32 because it's sort of the lead in to the moral Gentiles because they know, verse 32 from chapter 1, they know the ordinance of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do them, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. This group of Gentiles and Jews know that God has spoken through the written word against such things. They know the penalty for such things. They too practice these things with this knowledge and they do them anyway. Additionally, they give their full approval to others who practice uh, them. Men stand condemned because they do not have faith in Christ. But not only that, according to Paul, they stand guilty by willful ignorance, loss of the knowledge of God once that was once universal, uh, the silent testimony of the creation condemns them by senseless idolatry, by a manner of life that is sexually perverted, by a godless pride, by consciences that accuse them, and so on. But by the grace of God, all these sins are paid for by Christ when a person believes the gospel. So here we begin in chapter two, verse one. Therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. So therefore is connecting what was written about the pagan Gentile with the conclusion that follows. This section begins to deal with future wrath future judgment that men are storing up because they did not respond to their consciences. They would not be able to judge unless they knew it was wrong. Their consciences tell them that. These are the hypocrites who judge because they are guilty of the same things they are judging others for doing, and in doing that they condemn themselves and are without excuse. The conscience uh, is the internal decider of right and wrong, and it serves as a judge when a person must decide whether something is right to do or not right to do. The conscience must be properly informed if it is to make a proper right and wrong decision. It either has the right standards or the wrong standards to decide by. And this is why Paul will tell us that we have to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, Romans 12.2. And that's part of our what we call practical sanctification. So first of all, you must be justified. You must believe that Christ died for our sins and was raised again from the dead. That's called justification. And once we are justified before God, that's our position, permanent position before God. Now we begin our practical sanctification, which is to be set apart for God's use. And to do that, we have to renew our minds. So our, our conscience must be now informed uh, in, a, in a way that is consistent with God's thinking. So we study the Word of God, we trust the Word of God, we obey the Word of God, and when we pray the Word of God. So the little acronym STOP is very handy for that. And this is how you properly inform your conscience. Without the renewing of your mind to have an informed conscience, your standards uh, to make decisions come from the world system, which belongs to the God of this world who is Satan. And that is why um, you can call something good that God calls evil and your conscience is not bothered by it. Satan is setting your standards and not the Word of God. This is a good time for a teaching moment about what is going on in our country. Generations of our kids have been taught secular humanism, which is basically Satan's standards, as their standards for conscience rather than the Word of God. And some of them may be even Christians. They've got saved at church. They believed in Christ and they got baptized and they go to Sunday school, but in the uh, education system where they spend at least uh, 40 hours a week, uh, they're being taught secular humanism. So we see them at church, we see adults, uh, see them at church, we elect them to office, we raise them, raise them as our own sons and daughters. Some of them even quote Bible verses to support their actions. But it's not sound biblical doctrine that informs their consciences, but the doctrines of demons. They don't interpret scripture correctly. They misuse it and misapply it. So this week we see the fruit of these generations ascending to absolute power over the people of the United States as the Biden administration is sworn in. 
The agenda in front of them is as anti-God and anti-biblical as can be because what is behind it is the influence of humanism and the doctrines of demons. It appears that God is going to allow this group of people, that is the Biden administration, to successfully accomplish the transition of America into what is called the New World Order in preparation for the kingdom of the Antichrist to take place. And in their consciences, they believe they're doing what is right because their standards are all wrong. Satan is influencing their thinking, and he knows his time to have his man in place is nearly here. He always has an Antichrist ready to ascend to power since he does not know when God will rapture his church. See 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Christians will now live in the post-Christian America. It's in a country hostile to all that they believe. You as a Christian must understand these things must happen as the plan of God progresses toward the rapture of the church and the day of the Lord's wrath and the return of Christ to set up his 1,000-year kingdom. Our battle is already won. Those who are believers, our battle is won. We hold the high ground in heaven. We are seated with Christ. We stand uh, firm here until he takes us physically back to heaven. And it is there that we will be given our assignments for ruling and reigning with him in righteousness when he returns as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This current evil age has got to run its course. And uh, I recommend that you pray 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2 each morning, Galatians 5, 16 and 17, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, and Titus 2, 13, so that you don't get overwhelmed by all of the evil uh, that is about to be unleashed on this country and around the world as this new world order comes into place. And it is surely coming into place. Remember how Daniel lived successfully as a Jew under the rule of the Gentiles in a foreign land. It's a good book to read and get some current applications for how we might live successfully in this hostile time. Verse 2, And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. Believers know this. We've seen it several times in the Bible already. The flood, the Egyptian army, the genocide of the Amorites, the coming day of the Lord's wrath. We know about the great white throne judgment where all people of all time who have failed to trust God will be judged. God's judgment is always right since only God knows all the motives and all the opportunities that a man has had in his lifetime. Verse three, but do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself that you're going to escape the judgment of God? People actually do think they're going to get away with this. They can judge someone else for the very same thing they are doing. God will not judge them. They think this because of verse 4. God seems to allow people to get away with it. Or is it something else? Verse 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and the tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? God is kind and gracious, and he gives people time to repent. God does not want anyone to perish. In Genesis 6, there was approximately 7 billion people on the earth, according to the estimates of Dr. Henry Morse. It was according to scripture that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of his heart was evil continually. Yet God gave them a preacher of righteousness, a man named Noah, and a period of 120 years to hear his preaching. And then God judged them with a global flood. Another period is coming to this earth and it's called the day of the Lord's wrath. The church will be gone at that point. The day of the Lord will begin and it'll last for at least seven years. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached during that time. 144,000 Jewish evangelists will be preaching and it will end when a remnant of the Jews will believe and call out for their Messiah, Jesus. He will come from heaven to rescue them. All men will have heard the message. Many will have believed. And now Jesus himself judges as to who will enter the kingdom. He will have this one judgment called the sheep and goats judgment, which is of Gentiles and the Gentile nations, and another judgment called the passing under the rod, which is for the Jewish people. And those who pass that judgment will go into the kingdom in their physical human bodies and populate the kingdom for a thousand years. Verse 5, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. 
So Paul is saying that men are storing up wrath, but not currently experiencing it. The wrath they will experience is future, and this wrath appears to be talking about the wrath of God unleashed on the earth during the day of the Lord described in the book of Revelation. Verse 6, who will render to each person according to his deeds? Everyone will be judged. Paul taught that the rapture of the church was imminent, and with it the day of the Lord would begin, and all people will be judged on their works. To those who persevere in doing good, seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. So on the one hand, we'll have believers of the church age. They'll be judged at the Bema Seat in heaven. Christ will judge our works done in the body from the time we became believers until death or the rapture. Not a judgment of sin. We're not facing any wrath from Christ. He's going to judge our works for the purpose of rewarding us. What he will reward us for is what was produced through us by his Holy Spirit. Here it is called doing good. This is the sense that as we depend on Christ and walk in the Spirit, His good is produced through us. What will be burned up or unrewarded is what we produce through our flesh. That's unrewarded. Perseverance is that we desire to be free of these bodies of sin, the flesh, and we choose to walk in the Spirit more than the flesh. The more time we walk in the Spirit, the more God will use us for His purposes, and the more of His good is produced, and the more conformed to the image of Christ we become, and the greater our reward will be. Having demonstrated our loyalty to Him and receiving His rewards in heaven, He then tells us our assignments in the kingdom to rule and reign with Him during the thousand years. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation, on the other hand, when the rapture occurs, there will be nothing but unbelievers left on the earth who have been storing up wrath for themselves, and now the day of the Lord's wrath begins. God's righteous judgment for their deeds begins. Verse 9, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. Only Jews and Greeks are left on the earth since the church of God has been removed from the earth. Everyone left on the earth is an unbeliever. God's wrath, which they have been storing up for themselves, will now be experienced in the form of temporal judgments on the earth. The description of this time and detail would be written later by John in the last book of the Bible called the book of Revelation. The judgments come in a series beginning with the seven seal judgments, followed by the seven trumpet judgments, followed by the seven bowl judgments. Matthew 24 and 25 also describes these judgments. Verse 10, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now during this terrible time of the wrath of God, many who enter the day of the Lord will become believers, both Jews and Gentiles. They will hear the gospel of the kingdom preached and become believers. They will have faith and will be justified by that faith. Many will be martyred for their faith. They will be like the Old Testament believers, not church age believers who are unique in all of the Bible. They will be judged by Christ at his second coming and will enter his kingdom in their human bodies to populate the kingdom. For there is no partiality with God. Everyone will face judgment by God, the church, the Jew, and the Gentile. All will be judged on their works. The works of believers in the church age will be judged at the Bema Seat in heaven. The works of the Jews during the day of the Lord will be judged at the passing under the rod. And the works of the Gentiles during the day of the Lord will be at the sheep and goat judgment. Verse 12, for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So the previous verses have been dealing with physical punishment of the wrath of God felt by those on the earth during the day of the Lord's wrath. The exception is that the church is not under God's wrath. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But now Paul begins to talk about God's judgment at the great white throne. Here, all of the works of all unbelievers of all time will be judged at the end of the kingdom age. This speaks of the eternal judgment, whereas the judgment during the day of the Lord's wrath was temporal. This is the final judgment, final destiny of people in the lake of fire. Christ is their judge, and he sits on the great white throne. No believers appear here. John wrote in detail about this in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. So two groups of people are appearing at this judgment, Gentiles, those without the law, and Jews, those with the law. 
The Gentile sins against his internal conscience and the Jew against the external law. Neither have been justified by faith, so they have depended on their good works to save them. Both sinned and both will be condemned on the basis of their works. Both were savable, but both chose not to be saved. Verse 13, for it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Galatians 2.16 says that man is not justified but the law, by the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus. They will be justified because the law was their tutor that led them to believe in Christ, which was its purpose. Hearing the word was what many Jews believed gave them sufficient merit before God. And Paul, like James, is saying, no, it doesn't. It is the doers, not the hearers. Verse 14, for when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. Verse 16, on the day when according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Gentiles don't have the Mosaic law. The law, Mosaic law was given only to the nation of Israel. But when they do the things that line up with the law, their consciences become like that law. Their conscience is the law to them. God will judge them on their works against their consciences. Because they do know basic good from evil, it shows that they are image bearers of God and are accountable to him. Again, both groups, Jews and Gentiles, know they are accountable to God. They know they are sinners. They know that they face condemnation, condemnation unless somehow someone could save them from this terrible condition. God continues to work with Jews and Gentiles alike through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit and the gospel message preached by the church. All men can be saved. God wants no one to perish. Jews and Gentiles are saved the same way by trusting in the finished work of Christ who died for their sins. He paid the full penalty for their sins. God raised him from the dead to show all men he had accepted the sacrifice of Christ. All men are without excuse to believe the gospel. There is coming a day when Christ will judge those who rejected the gospel message and they who are already condemned and even knew it all along will receive the final eternal judgment into the lake of fire. Applications. Why does it seem like people get away with such evil today? Paul tells it it's because of the kindness and tolerance of God, giving all men a chance to repent. That is to change their minds about him and be saved. Most people waste this time and they simply practice more evil. They think they're getting away with it, so just keep doing what they're doing. And they practice more evil, they store up more wrath and more judgment against themselves. It is not because they don't know God will judge them. All men are without excuse, and someday their time will be up and they will face judgment. The wrath talked about in chapter two, Paul believed to be imminent. It's imminent in every generation. He also believed and taught the rapture to be imminent. So these two things happen simultaneously. There will be no warning. There will be a second in time when the last Gentile has come into the church. The church will be completed and Christ will bring his bride, the church, to heaven. At the very same moment, the day of the Lord's wrath will begin on earth against all unbelievers. Thus, Paul was telling all generations, including that one, that they are storing up the wrath of God, which would be poured out on them when they entered the day of the Lord, whichever generation that might be. The good news is that there will be many people saved during the day of the Lord's wrath as they hear the gospel of the kingdom, have faith, and if they survive this terrible time, they will enter the thousand year kingdom of Christ in their mortal bodies. They will procreate and populate and fill the kingdom and Christ will rule and reign and the church and glorified bodies will rule and reign with him. At the end of the kingdom, all the unsaved of all times will be judged at the great white throne judgment of Christ and will be cast into the lake of fire for eternal punishment. They could have been saved by faith during their lives, but they chose not to be. And that ends today's lesson. Next week, we'll talk about the Jews under the law. So this week, as you walk in the spirit, as you practice uh, your what we would call practical righteousness, 
Those things to keep in mind is the, uh, we talked about the acronym STOP, which is to study the Word of God, trust the Word of God, obey the Word of God, and pray the Word of God. It's uh, nothing better than praying God's Word back to Him. So walk in the Spirit as much as you can. If you fall out of fellowship with God, you want to use 1 John 1, 9 to get yourself back in fellowship with Christ. And uh, just uh, be looking up. The rapture could happen at any time. The way the events are shaping up right now, as, as the United States is being taken out of uh, its position and is moving toward the new world order, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if things start happening very rapidly now. So the rapture of the church could happen uh, at, at any point in time now, any second. So be looking up for our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, to take the church back to heaven. God bless you. Have a great week.